I'm Zibby Owens, and you're listening to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. This episode has been sponsored by Bookhampton. As the premier independent bookstore in the Hamptons, Bookhampton has a highly curated selection of books for readers of all ages, unique one-of-a-kind gifts, and exciting author events. Browse their fabulous staff suggestions online at bookhampton.com. Dr. Daria Long Gillespie is known popularly as Dr. Daria. She trained at Yale and Harvard Medical School before becoming an instructor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. She is a frequent contributor on CNN, Fox News, The Dr. Oz Show, and The Doctors, among others. She also writes The Busy Woman's Guide to Health and Sanity for The Huffington Post and writes for other publications like Share.com and The Dr. Oz Blog. Dr. Daria's new book is called Mom Hacks, 100 Plus Science-Backed Shortcuts to Reclaim Your Body, Raise Awesome Kids, and be unstoppable. She currently lives in Atlanta, Georgia with her husband, a renowned hand surgeon, and her two children. Welcome, Dr. Daria. I'm so excited to have you on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thank you, Zibby. I am honored to be here. Oh. So in your introduction to Mom Hacks, which I loved, you say that when you found some startling facts about mother's help, you became really worried for moms. You cited that a mom's risk of obesity rises 7% for every child she has, that moms are statistically more likely to have poor nutrition, get less exercise, have what you said was way less sleep, mm-hmm. <laughs> and face alarmingly increasing rates of pregnancy related complications and death in the United States. So tell me, is this actually what led you to write the book or how did the whole thing happen? So you are exactly right. Those statistics were were pretty shocking. And it's right, 7% increase of metabolic syndrome, which isn't just obesity, it's also cholesterol and high blood pressure for every child they have, which is crazy to me. But Zibi, I'm going to take it a step back because I was totally unaware of those statistics before I became a mom. I think most moms, it's pretty eye-opening. We anecdotally might think, well, yeah, we get less sleep. But to see the statistics against it was pretty shocking. But what first opened my eyes to it was I was pregnant and I was talking to a girlfriend of mine and kind of joking about how I couldn't run as well now that I was, you know, seven months pregnant. My bump was bouncing. And she kind of really shortly said, you know, enjoy that while you can, because once you have a baby, you're never going to get to work out again. (laughs) And, you know, it was probably the first time that I kind of heard that message. And then I started to, or it started to sink in. I realized a lot of women started, you would hear that you're never going to sleep again or eat well again, or, you know, eat anything but leftover chicken nuggets at the kitchen counter again, once you have children. And I kind of brushed them off at first, like whatever their naysayers, whatever I can do this. But when my friend told me that, it, it, it kind of struck a chord. And that's when I started doing some research. And that's when I found these statistics. Interesting. And you also had an episode in medical school with your own health struggles, which you wrote about in the book, and that affected you profoundly as well. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. And I think you're exactly right, because that episode in residency actually was what gave me the cojones and the confidence that I could actually do something when I was pregnant. So back up to when I was in residency, I'd been totally healthy. And then suddenly I woke up seemingly one day and my hands and my feet were swollen. My knees were swollen. It was all my joints were red and inflamed. And I went over the course of probably two weeks from being able to run three or four miles a day because I'd always been a runner to the point where I couldn't even stand up to examine my patients. I would sit on a garbage can or do something just to be able to get off my feet because I was in so much pain. So I went to a bunch of doctors. They ended up diagnosing me with this really chronic form of really a destructive autoimmune arthritis called psoriatic arthritis. There was nobody in my family who has it. Nobody knew why I got it. And they ended up putting me on an injectable medication. So I was giving myself an injection twice a week and that helped my symptoms. But now I, I was giving myself shots twice a week and really was told that this is the way your health is going to be for the rest of your life. You're going to need these shots for the rest of your life. And I did not like that answer. Right. And so I decided to start digging and doing a little research and started. That's what initially started me looking at all of this. And so things that ended up later someday becoming hacks in my book were just solutions I was desperate to find and started really making drastic changes to my health and my life. And I remember one person when I told him I was going to do this 
And they said, oh, that'll never work. <laughs> yeah, really supportive friends. Got to love it. Thanks yeah. for the vote of confidence. <laughs> and so it worked, Zibby. Over the next you know, few years, I was able to wean myself off of my medications. I came off them. And I haven't been on them since. And that's you know, really quick caveat. I am not saying that medications are bad. I am a Western-trained physician. I went to Yale, like you, and did that training. So I highly value that. But I also truly believe that there is a significant place for lifestyle and other significant holistic changes, and especially in my case. So all of that to say, I'd been told no once, and I found a solution. So when I got told that same no as a pregnant woman, it was like deja vu all over again. And I was like, okay, time to roll up my sleeves. I've figured this out before. Let me see if I can do it again. Meanwhile, I can't believe you were still running at seven months pregnant. You should have seen me at seven months pregnant with like oh. all my various pregnancies. I was not running. <laughs> was like, oh, by pregnancy. Well, it was, a, it was a bounce. And by pregnancy too, I swear, like I was bouncing by like seven days probably, you know, by <laughs> your, everything is just a little looser the second and and your pregnancy, as you know, I'm sure. <laughs> so after you did all this research, you decided to put all these hacks into a book so that you could help other moms use these lifestyle techniques to be healthy and have a you know better quality of life and everything. And you said in your book, exactly. hacks don't add to your to-do list, they make it easier to do, which is great because nobody needs more stuff to have to do, right? I mean, <laughs> I don't have time to go pee in private. I don't have that luxury. So how could I, I had to make these very easy to, and very actionable. How old are your kids? So five and two. Oh yeah. I have five and yeah. four. I have five, four and yeah. then 11 year old twin. So anyway, I get it. I get oh that. <laughs> oh yes. You are so, you so get it. And the reality is when I was in the ER, I felt this sense as a physician of being really in control. And I knew whatever came through those doors, I knew that I've got this, I can handle it. But then when I was a patient and when I was a mom, especially I didn't feel that way. And I saw my own patients and my friends who were moms and we were all kind of like, and I don't got this sort of stage. Mm -hmm. So that's really why I said, you know, how can I take that mentality that helps me succeed and it's total chaos in the ER, which really isn't that different from mothering many days. And how do I create a system so that we all have that I've got this in our lives as moms? Yeah. And so you like wrote the handbook, which is great. <laughs> it was everything I wished I had had about seven years ago. Love it. So I started flipping through your nutrition section. Ironically, my kids had come back from a birthday party and I had stolen one of the party favorite cookies, this like sugar cookie of a school bus that like I didn't want them to know that I'd even take it. I have that in my mouth as I'm like reading your book and I'm like, this is not good. <laughs> this is just not, <laughs> this is not good. Well, that, you're, you are exactly right. You bring up the point like moms don't need another book saying, hey, don't eat cookies. I mean, yeah, gee. Thanks. I know. We I know, know that. that. I know. I know that. <laughs> mm -hmm, exactly. And we don't need another thing saying, you know, just use more willpower, Zibby. Maybe you should have just tried harder. Or those really helpful articles I find that are like, don't eat chocolate, replace it with carob and a celery. Like again, not helpful to me in my life. Right. So, you know, in those situations, it's like one of the most fascinating things about the book, there are a couple of different themes, but one is how influenced we are by our environment. Mm -hmm. And we like to think we're really intentional and deliberate, but your environment makes a huge difference in what we do. So that can be a bad thing when you have cookies sitting there, but if they're not sitting there, it's actually a really good thing and we can leverage that. So I was like, well, how can I turn that what is otherwise a disadvantage into an advantage. So digging through the research, there was one study that showed that when food or chocolate, because all behavioral psychologists use M&Ms apparently as their study <laughs> thing of choice. Don't ask me why. There's a, um, some after uh, this book, secret agreement between, yeah. you know, M&Ms and yeah, psychologists. Yeah, anyway. something <laughs> about chocolate and M&Ms. Like, there's a bigger lesson there. Maybe that's my next book. <laughs> they found that when the chocolate was six feet away, i.e. you had to actually stand up to get it, people ate 70% less. And they didn't say that they used any more willpower, 70%. Hmm. So I had a friend who had texted me and she was, the text was, OMG, I just ate all my child's Halloween candy after they left for school. So I told her this study. And so what we did is what I tell people is, so put one obstacle between yourself and the cookies or the M&Ms or the chips or whatever is your temptation of choice. She, I had her put it up on a higher shelf so she had to, she could still reach it because kids still probably want that in the house, but she had to actually get a step stool to reach it. 
And she found, she texted me about a month later saying, I haven't eaten Halloween candy in a month. I forgot about it. I didn't even think about it. I don't think that would be enough for me. <laughs> I like, no? well, okay. I will go, I will go down a flight of stairs and up a, a, a step stool. And I don't know if I know it's there, maybe, maybe there's something wrong with me. <laughs> no, but, but the interesting people say that statistics show you'll still eat. Even people who say that end up eating around 20 to 30% less, which okay. is still a big deal. Yes. With calories. So yes, just, that will help. Just with the word there. But okay. Okay. No, you're, you're absolutely right. But why do you think it is? So you have all these amazing science backed tips for, you know, eating well in so many different ways. And I don't mean well, like, it, you know, it's so binary, you know, you have to do one thing or the other, but just, you know, to improve everything. Mm -hmm. But sometimes like the emotions, and I feel like moms are particularly susceptible to this, especially being so sleep deprived and, you know, just needy for some sort of, you know, pick me up at the end mm -hmm. of the day when mm -hmm. the kids go to sleep. What can we do about the emotional component of sort of the, the eating? Yeah. Not the, I mean, we so, I, like, I know, yeah. we all know that it's not good to eat this stuff. But, you know, yeah, absolutely. And so that's an entirely separate point. So I still say put it away. But then there you're right. You're getting to a much deeper reason. And we as humans are driven to do that. It's a when you eat that kind of sugar and fat and salt, it activates the same part of your brain as the addictive drugs do. And for millennia, that stuff was a short supply, like our caveman grandmother, even if she wanted to, couldn't go binge on cookies after she, if she was mad at our caveman grandfather for being a literal Neanderthal. So our brains are wired. It's just that now we live in an environment when it's possible. So the main thing in that case is to try to figure out why. Like why, why are you trying to eat the cookies then? Is it because you actually have to go do laundry and you don't want to do laundry? So cookies, <laughs> stopping and keep eating cookies is like a great way to, 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 to buy your time or procrastinate. Or, you know, is it some boredom? Is it disappointment or upset? What is the emotion? Or is it just that you need a break? I know as moms, especially, we think like, I can't take a break right now. I have to do laundry, kids work. I have to go grocery shopping. I need to send out these emails for work. And the food actually is your moment of having a break, well then find something else that gives you a break and give yourself permission to do that. Instead of five minutes eating chocolate cookies, is it a walk? Is it, you know, watching some silly video on, you know, on Facebook or that makes you laugh or um, what calling a friend and giving yourself permission to do that other reward. Yep. Often after it, you'll find you don't actually want the cookie at all. The thing that I do, and I don't know about you, but I have actually found that reading is the thing that makes me like, that's the treat I look forward to all day is like, when I, can mm -hmm. I get in bed and start reading again? So yes, exactly. I love how you have a podcast and moms don't have time to read books, but yet reading is what you love. Obviously you enjoy it. It's a, it's a time <laughs> issue, right? It's a time um, and issue. Yes. And, and, and giving yourself permission to do that. Yeah, exactly. That's okay. It's okay to take that time. And I think that's the main reason and trying to address it. If you Stop and try to address the emotions. And sometime when you're not in the throes of those emotions, kind of figure out, take two minutes, moms who are listening right now, what are your usual triggers to reach for the ice cream or the cookies or things? And what helps you feel better? Because let's be honest, eating the cookie doesn't actually feel better. At the end, you feel more guilty. And the problem is still there in the first place. Mm-hmm. Well, it feels kind of good, but <laughs> it's okay. But anyway, it like, feels good for enough, about a second. I, 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 that. I know, about a second. I know. But this actually, this goes into also what you're saying about exercising and how, you know, those five minutes that you were saying, like, read or, you know, do something for yourself. You have us, like, reframe exercise into small achievable goals. Like, we don't have to go spinning and dance cardio and, like, you know, killing ourselves. But even five minutes a day is good. And it's, like, good enough if that's, yeah. it's better than zero. So it's, it's like. so much better than zero. Yeah. Like one time I was playing doubles tennis, you know, and I was like, is this even really exercise? Like I'm barely moving, you know, is this, you know, and then I was saying, I mean, I could be just sitting here, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. you know, I, mean, I feel yes. like moms are so hard on themselves. I mean, I know I can be hard on myself. I'm sure you can, like, mm -hmm. you know, if it's not up to some sort of, you know, pre-kid goal of like, I'm running six miles or something, is one mile even really worth my time? But I think the answer mm -hmm. is absolutely yes, right? I mean, don't you agree? The absolute. And your answer is a thousand percent. Yes. So I had written this hack. Um, a mom friend had, she and I were on the phone and she said, yeah, I didn't work out this morning because I didn't have 30 minutes. And I was like, wait, wait, like exercise is not binary. There is no exercise police. And if you only worked out for seven or 17 or 27 minutes, but they're like, nope, you don't get to stop <laughs> it off. It doesn't count. Like it doesn't exist. And in fact, 
studies show that when women are told just exercise in seven minute increments, and if you can do it multiple times a day, great, but just aim for seven minutes, those women exercised more per week and actually lost more weight than women who were told to go exercise for a 30 to 40 minute aerobics class. Hmm. So you actually end up working out more, which is the crazy thing, because think about it, like whether it's you have to get up in the morning or you're tired, I can do it for seven minutes. And I am not telling people go for seven minutes and then hopefully you'll stay longer. I don't want people to do that because then if they don't, they feel bad. Like the point of hacks is it's tiny things. And why are they tiny? Because you can do them and I want you to do them and I want you to succeed. I want, because that's an endorphin bump. Yeah. Just like you go for your cookies, you're going for endorphins. And if you can check off, my goal was a five minute or a seven minute walk. I did it. You get an endorphin bump. You realize that you are a person who can go for a walk in the morning. And yeah, sure. Eventually that will probably increase. That doesn't matter to me. I just want you getting that sense of success and it is just as good for your health. So make it small, make that the goal. And you'll realize that you can do that. So I downloaded this app recently from the Fit, like a Fitbit app. Uh-huh. And they have seven minute workouts. And like yeah. each one is a minute. And I actually did it once or twice with my kids too, because they thought it was so fun. Yes. I know one of your hacks was, you know, giving kids maybe some sort of special toy or something when mommy exercises, like, okay, kids, like, here's your special, I don't mm-hmm. know, something. But if you can have them work out with you, that also can help. But both are great. That's a great way. I mean, that's even better because ideally when you're exercising, you're getting your kids to exercise because then you're teaching them they're not only are they getting fitness, they're learning that it's kind of fun. It's a thing you can do as a family. So we have, you know, once or twice a week, every weekend, we go on a hike together. You know, it's, I mean, it's nothing intense because I have a five and a two year old. Right. So it's a two to three mile hike, but we get out and we do it. Doing your videos with them. That's amazing. In terms of the toys. So what I do for this is I actually have like this kitchen that I got from uh, like secondhand from a friend. And so I have that in this unfinished section of my basement. I have a treadmill and I have a little pen down there so that my child can't get out of the pen. My brother says I put my child in jail. Um, <laughs> kind of looks like that, but it, he has the kitchen in there. He loves to play with the kitchen. He has all sorts of random toys in there. But the only time he gets to play with that kitchen is when I'm running. Mm-hmm. So he actually does look forward to it. Doesn't mean I can run for 45 minutes. No, it means I get usually about seven minutes and I have to stop because he's thrown something out of the pen and he wants it. But again, that's okay. So they have these special toys that keeps them entertained at least so I can get a seven or maybe a 15, 20 if I'm lucky run and it makes a big difference. That's great. The sleep section of your book had so many helpful things that I was actually, and not for kids, not for kids, for parents. Like, well, <laughs> like I, I mean, kids, kids both. too. I shouldn't say not for kids, for both. But I am used to sort of reading advice books about kids sleep and I am less used to finding information that helps me with sleep because I feel like it's like a lost cause, right? Like, <laughs> But your advice right. is sort of like, it's not a lost cause. Like, you know, last night my daughter was up for 40 minutes dressed up like mm. a wolf. She came in and like had put on a wolf costume in the middle of the night. I don't know. I don't know what happened. But anyway, it took 40 minutes to get her back to bed. And then by the time I got back mm-hmm. to bed, I was like thinking about all the stuff I had to do all day and da, 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 and, mm-hmm. course, and I couldn't stop. So I actually thought about how you wanted us to set a worry time or like have a worry lock yes. box before bedtime. And I was like, okay, I'm going to like set all my worries aside. And, you know, I mean, maybe I, I should have done it ahead of time. But anyway, I, I really appreciated that tip and all your, oh, your other tips on sleep. That's wonderful. I was going to ask you which one was your favorite. So you think that was your favorite on sleep with the worry lock box? Yeah, because then it's like out of the way, right? Like I've already, Mm -hmm. you know, even, I mean, that helps just with life. You know, I feel like, I don't know, I'm like a worrier. You know, my grandma says Mm -hmm. like I have her worry gene or whatever. And I think a therapist, (laughs) therapist might call it something else. But anyway, having a a set time to Mm -hmm. put it all down and get it out so it doesn't creep in, you know, like otherwise it'll just come out. It'll come out anyway if you don't deal with it, right? So I think that was my favorite tip for that you gave. It absolutely will. And the worry lock box is great for anybody who's just kind of struggling, like all of us. I mean, and of course, like after you become a mom, there's just so much more to worry about, plus the things you already worried about before. So that's why I love the worry lock box because you can spend five minutes just put it all in there, write everything. Like don't censor yourself. But then at the end of that time, See, I'm done. It's locked away. That worry is locked away. I can look at it again tomorrow or I can write more about it tomorrow, but now is not the time. So it's helpful both for the day 
and when you can't sleep. And that said, yes, you are right. It's better if you be, do it proactively. But if there's something keeping you awake at night, you can get out your little worry journal. Journal, not your phone, because your phone is too much blue light. Write it down. Like, dump it in there. Like, let it take your burden right then and there. Leave it there, and then you can go back to bed. Yep. Another one of my favorite tips was in your resilience section, and mm -hmm. it was the test of will it bother you in five years? Like, whatever is bothering you yeah. right now, is this really going to bother you in five years? And if it isn't, then mm -hmm. just, like, move on. <laughs> right. Let it go. I mean, how often do we keep, hold on to all those little tiny things that when you can know that you're like, I think I was mad at that person about that five years ago or 10 years ago. I have no idea why. And so it just, it, it's silly to hold on to it. So yeah, that's one of my instant de-angering techniques. It can be hard. That's why I usually need to do the breathing exercise first. Yep. So then, then I can say, because you know, often if I'm already angry, then will it bother me in five years? Well, I don't know, but it bothers me right now. Do my breathing exercise first. Just that in for four seconds, hold it for four seconds out for four seconds, hold it for four seconds, do that a couple times. And then I can say, you know, will it bother me in five years? Okay. Okay. I'm going to let it go. So Daria, you are a doctor. You're a mom. You run, you are on TV all the time. You write. What hacks are getting you through life? Like what are your top three for you? So, yeah. So actually you said the run as if it's an accomplishment. It the is. run is the hack. No, <laughs> it is the hack. And people need to know that because it's not, you know, I am no superwoman. I don't have any of this figured out. I just have figured out the things that helped me to keep my sanity. So the run is indeed how I do all those things. There were many times that I was stuck with the writer's block where I just didn't care anymore about the book. I wanted it to be done. And, and that's where I, I reached those points. And, you know, maybe that's when I wanted to reach for the cookie or something. And so I'd go for a run. And that maybe for other women, that's maybe something different. Maybe that's a walk. Maybe it's a Zumba class or a video or whatever. Everybody's different. So if you hate running, then that's another key part of my book is like, if you hate running, then please don't try. Do something you like with a doubles tennis. That's fine. So for me, the running is a really big deal in terms of keeping my sanity. And to help me do that, I have all my playlists. Like again, music is a big, you probably noticed throughout the book, I'm always quoting song lyrics or things like that. So I've created these playlists and I have a running playlist that I only let myself listen to when I run. And now I've shared it for anybody who orders the book, they get access to five different mom hacks playlists. And like, it gets me going and it's like the good memories and it just, it makes me go and it makes you go run, not go the other. Thing. Right. <laughs> um, and uh, as a mom, we always have potty break on the mind. Mm -hmm. So that's, for me, running is a huge deal. And having that music to help me do that makes a very big difference. So exercise is truly how I keep my sanity and keep anxiety and all those worries at bay. I mean, there have been studies from Duke that showed they gave women who had depression, either were given an antidepressant or were put on a, an exercise regimen. And they both of those groups had the same rate of remission of depression. So exercise it gives you those endorphins. It, like, if there is a magic pill for, for mental health, not to say that people still don't need medications, of course, but exercise is massive for that. So that's one. Two is my routine. I need to have a little routine in the morning. I have every morning I get up at the same time, I go for a run, and then I come and maybe catch up on email for about a half hour, and then I really get into like anything creative I need to do. I have to have that because otherwise, like with our days as moms, like it, it's just our day gets out of hand. So my routine, that all starts before my kids wake up. Wow. So that's been really important to me as well. What time do you wake up? So I get up at 5.15, okay. but I'm not a morning person. So again, how did I do that? I hacked it, hacked my way to getting up at 5.15 because if I had my way, I'd stay up till two in the morning and then love to sleep in. But with kids, if I don't work out in the morning, I'm not going to have time to do it later. Mm -hmm. So again, tiny changes. So I didn't just one day say, I'm going to wake up at 5.15 and go run three miles. I pushed my sleeping a little bit earlier by 15 minutes. And I'd actually say I'm, I would just go run a mile or I would do something else I enjoyed. Sometimes I'd get up and meditate for 10 minutes. So first I was just getting used to waking up early. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I would just get up and read and have coffee and get that in. Once I started getting up earlier, then I started adding in the exercise in short increments and building it up. So it took about six weeks for me to get to be able to do that, if not more. Mm -hmm. So that's okay. Again, don't say tomorrow, I'm going to wake up at 5 a.m. and I'm going to go run three miles because you'll be miserable and you won't do it. And you'll eventually give up after three days and feel badly about yourself. Do it incrementally. So do you have any advice to other 
aspiring authors out there? Right. <laughs> so uh, sure, that brings up so many different thoughts. But aspiring authors, you know, speak with other authors. There's a lot of different author groups. Learn from other people who have gone through it. And then just start writing because it took me, you know, I've been doing media for about, uh, you know, several years. And it, my first couple of years, it took me several years to really find my voice. Mm -hmm. And that takes time. And the only way to find your voice is to just write a whole lot of things. I wrote a blog the other day and I shorted it really quickly. And my friend had commented, emailed me back and she said, this is great. And she said, do you realize that, you know, two years ago, this would have taken you two weeks to write. And now you pulled it off in about 30 minutes. Hmm. It's practice. Writing, like anything else, takes practice just to do it and to find your voice. So that's the number one thing I would tell any aspiring writer is just get started. Awesome. Well, I know you have to run. So thank you so much for being on Mom's Time Time to Read Books. Thank you for all the tips. I'm going to be thinking of you as I, you know, go about my my day today and every day, you know, with all the, the, yes. the helpful things. So oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> One more tip for the morning. If you want to wake up, this is a really easy thing everybody can do. Most of us, we wake up and we keep it dark for a while because that bright light kind of hurts. What I want people to do to start if making it easier for them to wake up, first thing you do in the morning, get bright light. Yes, it hurts for about a hot second, but that bright light shuts off your body's melatonin production. So you have more energy in that moment, but not only that, since it resets your body clock, it's like doing that hard reset on your iPhone. It means you're going to have an easier time falling asleep that night and an easier time waking up the next morning. So the first thing I do is I get my phone and I, in the morning, I look right at my phone or I flip on my bathroom lights bright. And that is a key part of my routine, kind of like a biohack that everybody can do that is no effort at all. Excellent. Okay. I can do that. <laughs> yeah. Little tip. Little there tip. you go. Um, right. Debbie, thank you so thank much. Thank you so it was much. Really a pleasure. Me too. For me too. Thanks so much. Have a great day. You too. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. This episode has been sponsored by Bookhampton, bookhampton.com. Thanks to Ryan and Steve at Texture Sound for the audio editing and mixing. Thanks for listening to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Mm-hmm.